on, church? Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Advent. And in case I don't see you, Merry Christmas. Great to see you. Guys, by the way, y'all, what was that third song? Un- unto your name? Holy cow. That was awesome. I thought the roof was going to come off. So that just got to me. So my contacts are not sitting on my eyeballs right now because the Lord just visited me in a powerful way. So I apologize if I start speaking gibberish today. This is Advent, and I am so excited because it kicks off our journey towards Christmas. And the whole reason we started to observe Advent a couple years ago was because, quite frankly, Amy and I would look around like December 26th, and we'd be like, what happened? Where did Christmas go? Did, did, did it just happen? Did we miss that? Like, wh- who stole Christmas? Where did it go? I, I could have sworn it was yesterday, but I can't remember it. It was such a blur, and we were in such a rush to get to it that we just kind of looked at each other and said, I think I missed Christmas. Who took it? If you've seen it, please return it. You know what I mean? It was one of those things. That, does anybody identify with that? That sometimes Christmas just seems like such a hectic go, 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 and blur. That's what Advent is for, to force us to stop, to pause, to ponder, to participate in the ancient longing, just like Israel did, where they were so ready for the Redeemer. Man, it was a dark time, y'all, dark. We are so blessed and so content that we don't fully appreciate what happened 2,000 years ago when the light of the world came and wrote himself into the love story to buy us back. Y'all, that is good news. That is awesome. That is something that should not be hurried. It shouldn't be rushed through. I hope this journey for the next four weeks will realign our expectations so we can experience Christmas the right way. Because let's be honest, we all know that there are those people who go overboard at Christmas. Those people who are so excited about Christmas that they, they want to start the Christmas music after Labor Day, right? You know what I'm talking about? And that's, that's, that's early even for me. We all have that one friend who looks like this, who's just so excited. Santa, I can't wait. First, we'll make snow angels for two hours. Then we'll go ice skating. Then we'll eat a whole roll of Toll House cookie dough as fast as we can, and then we'll snuggle. <laughs> Don't these guys, you just want to like punch them in the nose. We all have those friends, and they're just so, they mean well, bless their hearts. And sometimes I feel like I've been that guy. I've been so excited about Christmas, man. I'm like, it's Halloween. I'm hanging tinsel, and, I'm, and not the purple kind. I'm talking like the real Christmassy silver kind. I want to ring the silver bells, and, you know, it's just, it's so easy to get caught up in the hectic, in the go-go, in the rush, in the over-commercialization of Christmas. And I found myself, we all have that one neighbor who cannot wait to outdo you with the Christmas lights, right? This guy right here who says, man, I Christmas harder than you do. That's it. Bring it. Y'all have that? Every neighborhood's got one. Just keep looking. If you can't find it, (laughs) you're the one. (laughs) Look in the mirror. You just might be the one. Advent is a time of waiting. And if you're not sure what Advent is, if you haven't been around and you don't know this, what exactly is it? Because most of us are vaguely familiar with things like this, these Advent calendars. And they're great, and there's nothing wrong with them. We have one. You could go and open a little door. Inside, if you're spiritual, you'll have a scripture verse. If you're less spiritual, you'll only have chocolate. And if you want to mix the two, you can have a chocolate scripture verse, and you can have this, and this is a great way to keep your mind focused, but it's so much deeper than that. Advent is one of the oldest traditions in the church, and it usually is symbolized by a green evergreen wreath circling four candles. The, the round evergreen wreath right here shows you the unending love of God, and each candle you light each different Sunday. The first one represents hope, then love, then joy, then peace. And then on Christmas Eve, there'll be a white candle, and that represents the light of the world that has come. Each one, each flame takes us a little bit closer to that night when the love of the world came in human form, the form of a Christ child. I loved how Isaiah said it. Isaiah said it here in 9-2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. He's talking about this this light that comes and invades our darkness no matter where you are. So each week, we're going to light a candle. Let me go ahead and have my volunteer come up and help with Lily. You're the one. I got it over here. We're going to light this first candle. This first candle is called the candle of hope. And each week, every candle we light will bring us just that much closer to 
the Christmas Eve story with the Christ child. Good job. Thank you. So if you would like to be the one to light this, would you just see Shannon? Because each week we'd like a different volunteer to come up and do this. And I am so excited to finally be able to light this candle. What is Advent? If you're not familiar with the term, it's a Latin term. And it simply means the coming or the arrival. And it is a beautiful reminder that something is imminent. There is an ancient longing. There is anticipation. It's supposed to be heightened with expectation. So ask yourself right now, where are you on the expectation meter for Christmas? Are you a one? Five? Are you a 10? Are you like the elf? It's Christmas! Where are you on that? Because I hope you have a chance to dial that in and join with ancient Israel and anticipate the longing because this journey is going to center this time on the star. The star that showed us the light of the world over Bethlehem. And it is going to be the central place in the Christmas story for us this time. But what if I told you that the mention of the star is actually very rare? In fact, it's only mentioned one place, and that's Matthew chapter 2. It's the only time we read about it. So go ahead and turn there, open your Bibles, or pull up your favorite Bible app to Matthew chapter 2. And that's where we're going to begin our journey today. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Those of you who are still out of town coming home from Thanksgiving, travel safely. Can't wait to have you back with us. Matthew chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 10. Let's follow along together. And it says this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived from Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star at its rising, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was incredibly happy. Yours doesn't say that, does it? He was deeply disturbed. Here's something fascinating, and not just him, all of Jerusalem with him. I wonder why. Verse 4. So he assembled all the chief priests and the scribes and the people, and he asked them where this Christ would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they answered, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men, and he asked them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child, for when you find him, report back to me so I too can go and worship him. Was he telling the truth? Oh, negative, negative. Verse 9, after hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. And I love verse 10. Read this slowly. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Overwhelmed with joy. What about you? Right, let's do an inventory. When was the last time you were overwhelmed with joy for anything? When was the last time? They were overwhelmed with joy just seeing the star. Didn't even comment on what it portended and what was waiting at the base of this star. Through the years, there's been a lot of discussion about this star. Some people say, well, you know, we're not really sure what it was. We're not really sure if it was a combination of stars. Some say Jupiter was rising and there was all kinds of stuff and there's this beautiful cosmic event that happened. Others say, we're not really sure when it happened. We're not really sure who these wise men were. Were they magi? Were they astronomers? Were they astrologers? Were they, were they weird? What's the deal with that? We don't know. And if you're really interested in this whole story of Epiphany, you need to go and hear the sermon I preached in 2015. Go listen to Epiphany. It is so fascinating of when they actually arrived. Was it months after Jesus? Was it a year after Jesus was born? There's a very obscure verse that says, and when they arrived, they went to the house, indicating he'd already moved on from the manger. There's all kinds of beautiful hidden gold in there. Don't miss that. But I don't have time to go into that, so go get that message. If you are interested in Epiphany, you need to understand the whole context of this. Apart from all the debates, there remains this truth, and this is the truth we launch from today. The light of that star, no matter where you think it happened, no matter when it happened, that star led people to Jesus. Both then and now, it is still leading people to Jesus, the ultimate light of the world. So here's the good news. No matter where you find yourself today, if you're in darkness, if your world has been turned upside down, maybe you got that phone call you didn't want, maybe you got that pink slip, maybe there's something going on in your family that... No one even knows, and you are walking through it sideways right now. 
you are welcome on this journey. You are welcome today to join us toward that first Christmas, to join Mary and Joseph and the innkeeper and some common shepherds and some strange wise men and some angels and all kinds of common people where we, we, we think we have it busy today. And while the pace of our life might have made their heads spin to look at what we're dealing with, y'all, they were dealing with stuff too. It was a dark time, and we forget that because we sing the songs and we see the bright star and we think, woo, kumbaya, it's awesome. It wasn't like that. They were under intense persecution. Herod was a bad guy, and he was persecuting, and it was this jealous king. Man, they didn't have forewarning. We have hindsight. We look back on it and go, oh, we see this happens and this happens and we understand, and oh, yeah, they had the Passover, and that kind of foreshadowed what Jesus would be when he comes as the, the sacrificial lamb, and why can't they connect the dots? They didn't get it all, even when an angel appeared, even with the star. They think they got it, and some of them had glimpses of it, but they didn't have this hindsight where we can look back and go, wow, God is here, the Christ child. He is in human form. Very few people answered the call to come to the stable, but those who did were so blessed. So here's my first question for you. Will you come? Will you slow down in this season and pause and ponder and focus on the Christ child and not the commercialization and not all these things that distract us? No matter where you are in your life, will you say yes to this journey, no matter how dark your world seems right now? Because there is hope and there is light, even if your vision honestly seems dim today. That is the good news. And maybe it's tough for you to see through things right now. Maybe your night is so dark, it's darker than midnight. Maybe you've got so many things in this Christmas season that have already overwhelmed you. Struggles, financial struggles, family struggles. Maybe you've got relationship dysfunctions. Maybe you put the funky in dysfunctional. Maybe, maybe your family's that kind where you don't even want to get together with them. Maybe it's something deeper. Maybe your favorite football team didn't even bother to show up yesterday. <sighs> Y'all going to have to give me a minute. Oh. See what I'm saying? We're all dealing with our struggles. The struggle is real. Maybe you've got something else. Maybe there's an issue. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's here. Maybe you find yourself somewhere in the The point is the light of the star has coming. And at some time, we all have to come and pause because the good news is in the middle of the darkness, that's when God's love shines the brightest. It is a beautiful thing. So how do we, how do we follow this star? How do we, I'm with you, Matt. How do, we, how do we go on this journey? I'm in. Sign me up. I'm going to tell you the first step. But if you're like me, you're not going to like it. Are you ready? The first step, believe it or not, it's counterintuitive. It's to acknowledge the fact that there is darkness. Wow. Well, that seems kind of morbid. The reason why I don't like this one is because I'm an upbeat guy. And frankly, I'm positive, and it's so much easier for me to try to ignore the darkness. I feel better if I can pretend it's not there. I feel better if I can just go on in my pretend world and assume everything's great, everything's fine, we're awesome, we got it going on. Most of us in this room are born again, blood-bought, saved believers, so it's good, right? And it, the only problem with my pretend world is as soon as I walk out that door, I am slapped in the face with the real world, with darkness. There is darkness in this world. There is evil in this world. It's a fallen world until the second advent, until Jesus comes and makes all things right. I have a flashlight. This is, this is a really, really deep, deep message. So, so hang with me on this. I've got it turned on. And by itself, it's not terribly impressive in the midst of other light. In fact, if I diffuse it any, you can't even tell that it's hardly on unless you stare right at the bulb. Only problem with it, that's not what this light was for. It wasn't meant to shine amongst other lights. It was meant to shine in the darkness. Right now, it's not that big a deal. But as we turn out the lights and we get it slightly darker... <laughs> <laughs> you might notice this light just a little bit more. But if we were in a cave or we were in a coal mine and this was the only light, it would be a matter of life and death. This is what we would look for. We would be drawn to this light. Why? Because it shines brightest in the dark. And that's exactly how the star was. The stars are there right now. Can you see them? Not at all. You can't see them. 
In fact, if you really want to see it, you hope for a moonless night, no moon. You hope for a dark night where there's no pollution from the lights of the city, and then they show up the best. And that is exactly what happened here. Everything shines brighter in the darkness. As we bring the house lights back up, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever thought about why God chose a star? He could have announced his arrival in a million different ways. Why did he choose a star? Why not come himself? Why not send a, a, an angel just to declare it and be gone? Do you ever think about it? Throughout Scripture, here's a hidden gem for you. God often uses things he has created to reflect his glory. He often reflects himself in creation. He actually comes, and it's amazing that he chooses a star to guide them, his own creation to reveal himself to us. I love how the psalmist puts it. Read with me here in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no words. They don't have any speech. No sounds heard from them, but their voice goes out to all the earth, to the ends of the world. What a beautiful illustration for us. Psalm 8 takes it further. When I consider your heavens, the work of your hands, the moon, the stars, everything you've set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of us? What is humankind that you think of us? That is an amazing God who stoops to be with his people. I love that. The glory is seen in the stars. But here's the thing. Stars can't be seen in the light. When we face the darkness, and we are willing to call it what it is, church, when we don't play footsies with the world and try to be just like them in hopes to win them, Jesus never did that. In fact, he came and said the opposite. You are so much like the world, I can't even tell you apart. The church is called to be salt and light. And frankly, we don't hear that message much anymore because that's offensive. That's not politically correct. What are you thinking, pastor? It's supposed to be a group hug. We are the world. Well, yeah, but Jesus came for a purpose. And he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. No one comes to the Father that's me. That, that, those, those are his words. We have to call the darkness what it is in order to show the true light. That's what leads us on our journey. As we journey together toward Christmas, this Advent season, let's be honest about the darkness we find ourselves in. Not only in the world, oh, get ready, but the darkness we sometimes allow in our own hearts. Ooh. I was fine, Pastor, if you're talking about out there. <laughs> let's talk about Let's go back and talk about the darkness in the world. Get them. Uh, no, now's the time, church, we hold up the mirror. <laughs> and we say, Lord, is there darkness in my heart? Have I stopped making you my first love? Have I stopped walking in a pursuit of holiness? Call me back to that first love. Call me back to the light. I mean, the bad news, we know it. That we live in a world full of darkness and fear. But the good news is, it's in that great darkness that an even greater light dawned. And that is awesome news. The Bible tells us how dark it was for people of Israel. If you need a quick reminder, just look at this verse right here in Isaiah. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. In the Old Testament, man, they were waiting. You want to talk about a season of waiting? They were waiting a long time. We're talking hundreds of years for a Messiah. This prophecy had gone out. Isaiah comes and says, hey, guys, there's a coming light. It's coming in this present darkness. And guess what? The darkness continued to grow. I bet people started to doubt Isaiah. You said he's coming. <laughs> Where is he? Where is he? Here, Messiah. Where is he? You've been saying this. We're going on 400 years of silence now. We still haven't heard nothing. Where is this great light? This was a dark time. They lived in this horribly awkward time between the promise that was told for them and fulfillment of it. This stretch right here, no fun. <laughs> No fun. It's coming. It's coming. Y'all like knowing there's a present coming and it never shows up? <laughs> That's mean. Don't do that to your kids. Don't do that. 
It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Don't do that to them. And I know these people start, they didn't have the benefit of hindsight. They couldn't look back and go, oh, yeah, I see this and this. Today, maybe some of us are in that same desperate time. They were under Roman oppression. Things were bleak, man. People were getting killed. They were desperate for a deliverer. And to them, the waiting seemed like forever. Some of us are in a waiting room right now. Here's the good news. It is in that waiting. It is in our darkest nights that God shows up. He did it for Israel, and he will do it for us. We can find hope knowing that Jesus is who he says he is, and he entered the darkness at Christmas. So what's the next step in our journey toward the star? I don't want to tell you, because if you're like me, you're going to like it even less than the first step. But I got to tell you, because this is why we're here to hear the truth, the next step is to embrace the waiting. Yay! So excited. Raise your hand if you love to wait. <laughs> Thank you. Cademan, okay. All right. Me and Cademan, the only two who love to wait. No, nobody likes waiting. Why? Because it's painful and it's awkward and it feels like we're wasting time. And nobody likes to do that. In fact, we will even pay good money to avoid waiting. You know what I'm talking about? Let me, let me show you something. How about this right here? What's this? Disney Fast Pass, absolutely. I don't think I will ever go back to Disney without one of those bad boys where I got that wrist and it's loaded. Oh, you want to ride this ride? Show up at 1015. You're on. Boom. Yes. How much was that? 100 bucks? Take it. Take my money. It's worth it because we can't stand to wait. You know what I'm talking about? And I have good news. In my quiet time this morning, the Lord confirmed this will be in heaven. So there'll be no waiting, no waiting for the, for the great buffet, the wedding feast, none of that. That's not true, youngins, by the way. I'm just making that up. This is how we view waiting. And it was no different for the people of Israel. They didn't like to wait. They had been waiting for hundreds of years. They know God had offered this promise. In fact, if you really want to get serious, go back to Genesis chapter 3, where God shows up and he says, Eve, what's going on? Adam, what's going on? And he says, I'm going to give this prophecy. Through your offspring, Eve, will come one who will crush the head of the serpent. All the way back then, God had a plan from the start. He wasn't startled. He wasn't like, oh, goodness, what are we going to do now? They bit the fruit. God had a plan. But here's the problem. We're limited by time, and we hate waiting. We're limited to it. So all we see is it, it just seems to take forever. Lord, where are you? What are you doing? God, don't you know I've been praying about this answer to prayer? Don't you know my relationship needs healing? Don't you know my body needs healing? God, don't you know that my job is about to end? Where are you? No one likes waiting. But as much as we don't like it, here's the painful truth that is so good for us. Waiting helps our perspective. It gives us a godly perspective through the dark and the difficult days. The good news is, while we wait to celebrate Jesus' birth, while we look backwards and we join with Israel and we reach backwards and we experience the longing with them, we get to look forward to the ultimate hope, the hope when everything is be fulfilled, when Jesus comes again, his second advent. We don't call it that much, but that's what it is. He's coming. Oh, by the way, this time, he's not coming as a little helpless baby. He's coming as victorious king on a white horse with a name no one knows, garments dipped in blood. It is going to be amazing. And I so hope you know him. I hope your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If not, you can take care of that today through repentance. Not some easy believism, not just say this little prayer. I'll sprinkle some pixie dust. We make a mockery of what Jesus went through but a true heart change where we walk one way and we say, God, I surrender. I am going this way from my sin. You are Lord. And what we looked at last week, you can bow now willingly or you will bow later. Just like Goliath did when he fell face down with his dying breath. What he was unwilling to do his entire braggadocious, arrogant, crude life, he humbled himself in that final moment and fell face down even against his will. We look forward to the second advent when he takes care of everything, the ultimate fulfillment of all our hopes, when everything will be made right. Are you looking forward to that? How's your anticipation for that? May I be frank? If we are not excited about that, how in the world can we expect them 
to be excited, to understand the great hope we have. Look here how the Apostle John describes it. He says, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes, all peoples, all languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they shall hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun won't strike them. There will be no scorching heat, for the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. How awesome is that person who's struggling right now how awesome is that person just given the cancer diagnosis how awesome is that family who's hanging on by a thread how awesome is that that should give you hope every tribe i did some research this week and i did not get this word the greek word is phule p-h-u-l-e Really cool word, foule, like ole, but foule. And it is a great word, but it's used real common. It's used 23 times in the New Testament. And every time, it usually means generic, large grouping, like a tribe, like all y'all, okay? If it was Southern, that's what it would say. It would say all y'all. But guess what? In Revelation 7, that's not how foule is defined. Get this. Guess how it's defined here. No longer is this broad, generic, sweeping, geographical, do you live nearby, you're in? Oh, no, no, no. You ready, church? In this description, it is used to refer to a special people, unified through a distinct bloodline. The blood of Jesus has grafted us into his family. He becomes our high priest, and we are grafted in. We are adopted as Gentiles. Unless you're a Messianic Jew here, you are a Gentile, and you are grafted in, and we are unified through a distinct bloodline. Those who put their faith and trust in Christ will be part of that joyful reunion. I hope you'll be there. I hope you will be there. Through these dark days, this is where we draw our hope from. Not only looking backwards, but looking forward to the second advent. Today, we live in that awkward place, just like Israel, between what's already happened and what is not yet. So today, my challenge to you is this. Don't get discouraged in the waiting. Don't be discouraged in the waiting. I know it's rough. I know we look around and we see, man, there's people coming in. They're shooting people up in churches. And there's people just doing horrible things to innocent people all over the place. I mean, it's dark and it's so easy to get discouraged. We are told to be light and to embrace this waiting with hope, not as the world gives, but as Christ gives. That carries us forward through these dark days. You could say our hope is what fuels our faith. Mm -mm -mm. That's a sermon. Our hope is what fuels our faith. How's your fuel level? If it's low, we did the little oil dipstick thing. Dare I say your hope is probably low too. We don't think about it, and we don't hold that hope out in front of us of what's to come, and that's what fueled churches through hundreds of years, through dark times, through the medieval period, through the plague, and all these things. They knew it was bad, and people were dropping left and right, and they said, just hold on. It will all be made right. They held out hope. You want to experience Advent and Christmas more fully? Tired of zipping through it and then going, what just happened? This is how you do it. Allow the Advent season to be a reminder of the hope for what we do not yet see. Will you seek the light of the star, no matter how dim it appears to you today? If so, then you're ready to take the last step. And this is a good one. The last step is commit to the journey. Oh, finally, an easy one. That's right. Commit to the journey. Wait a minute, Pastor. Time out. Didn't you just say embrace the weight on step two? How in the world do those two things go together? Because to me, when I'm talking about waiting and going on a journey, <laughs> those are two different things. I don't think of those two the same way at all. One involves just kind of sitting around in my mind, and one involves packing up my bags and going somewhere. Here's the hidden gem. This concept, it may seem like an oxymoron to us, but when you look through Scripture, the Bible is full of what is called active waiting. Oh, I'm going to give you a minute to wrap your mind around that. Active waiting waiting. This is a beautiful concept. It's actually a deep truth. What on the surface seems like a conflict of interest, we wait with expectant hearts while we are constantly moving forward on our journey. 
We're never sitting still. We're not wasting time. We don't twiddle our thumbs. Much of the waiting we see in Scripture is just like this. It is very active. Henry Nouwen, the great theologian and Dutch writer, he wrote a book called Waiting for God, and he described it just like this. Active waiting means being present fully to the moment in the conviction that something is happening right there, right where you are, and you don't want to miss it. You want to be present to that moment. Y'all, that's a description of Advent. He stumbled onto something there. He didn't know I was preaching this today. I don't think. This is amazing. This is a description of Advent. Waiting means being active, present in the moment, while still anticipating where we're going. And that is easier said than done, because it takes strength and intentionality and courage to say, I will wait for you, Lord, but I am ready to take that next step. The psalmist encourages us how to do this. In Psalm 31, 24, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart, all you who what? Hope in the Lord. All right. Okay, pastor, so far I'm with you. What does this mean for me today? I love the exegesis. I love to dig deep things out. But what does it mean if we don't apply it to our life? How do we do this? Hope is waiting. Waiting involves commitment. Commitment to being present in the journey while being obedient. Oh, man, I was with you. I was with you. I'm okay with the waiting. I'm okay with the commitment. Did you really have to say the O word? Obedience. It all comes back to us striving to be like Christ. It all comes back to our walk with holiness. Peter gives us this glimpse. Read with me. He says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. I love these two words, alert sober. You know what that means? That's active waiting. That's active participation while you are still waiting on the Lord to show you. The good news is, no matter where you are in your journey, keep following God's light. Keep being willing to take that next step of obedient faith while you are in his waiting room. Oh, wow. Man, that's deep. Advent is the process we go through to get prepared. You know what it's not? It's not about having it all together. It's not about having all your answers. It's not about checking all the boxes. We'd love that. We want a list. Tell me what to do, 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 and I will do it. And we feel better when we can define God and put him in this box. Advent is about preparing our heart every day when we get, we just have to be present and to be expectant. Just show up and be willing to follow God's lead wherever you are. It's not too late. God's timing is perfect. Hear me. Somebody needs to hear that today. God's timing is perfect. If you are painfully sitting in that waiting room of heaven, take heart. Take heart. His timing is perfect, and he wants to fill you with hope while you wait. Expectant longing, and that's found in knowing his son. Advent is a time of hopeful waiting. If I can leave any thought with you as we light that first candle. Hope is found even in the waiting. Think of it like this. There's a farmer, and he's standing on a dry, dusty patch of ground. And things are not going good. As far as he can look, left and right, forward, backwards, is nothing but parched earth, sun-baked clay. Nothing is growing. In fact, he is just about to give up hope because years of drought have taken everything from him. And frankly, he is devastated. He is on the razor edge of just doing that. I'm done. He has lost all hope. And then something happens. He hears something in the distance. What he thinks is confirmed seconds later when he hears it again. The distant rumble of thunder. And as he looks, the clouds begin to come from the horizon. And he sees not the thunder. He sees what the thunder tells. The promise of rain. The rain that is coming. In an instant, hope returns to his weary soul. And that is Advent. John the Baptist showed this perfectly. When John showed up, the forerunner to Jesus, people started to come to him and flock to him and say, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? We've been waiting hundreds of years. We've had this long gap of silence. Are you the one? Are you the one? Please tell me you're the one. And he says, no, I am not the one. You know what I am? I'm preparing the road for him. I'm the forerunner. I am the thunder in the desert. Do you hear it? He is coming. 
John the Baptist showed us the thunder in the desert. Make road to straight for God. Your wait is almost over. Advent. Beautiful season. And it begins with waiting. And while it may be challenging, and while I admit it may feel unnatural, there is great benefit. If you really want to experience Christmas this year on a deeper spiritual level, more fulfilling than any you've had, it starts with waiting and embracing the hope that you know is to come. Advent allows us this time to focus, to hear that distant rumble, church, the distant rumble of thunder, the promise that is coming. And one day it will be fulfilled. One day. Will you be ready for that? Pray with me. God, I pray that if there's somebody here who just doesn't know you as Savior or Lord today, that they would. That they wouldn't leave this place before taking somebody by the hand and saying, tell me more about this saving power that came through the Christ child. God, for those of us who have known you, maybe we've walked with you years and years, maybe just just a few days, God, I pray that you would stir up the hope in us, that you would light that candle so we can shine bright in a dark world. Lord, we know there's darkness. We don't have to look far. We see it all around us. And Lord, at times we apologize. We see it in ourselves. But Lord, would you forgive us? Above all, Lord, we know you honor humility. So we humbly say, individually and even as a church, God, forgive us for our sin. Make us white as snow. Clean us up, Holy Spirit, as only you can. Seal us for that day of redemption. You are good. You are here. And we thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.